Hey, this is Ryan from The Prolific Creator, where we talk about life and art and see what sticks. Well, hello, my friends. So glad you are here with me today. However you found me, however you have this noise coming through your ear, whether you're on the treadmill or cleaning the dishes or walking the dog, wherever you are today in your car. So glad that you just stopped by the creator, uh, the prolific creator podcast. I don't even know the name of the show. Uh, so that tells you how my day is going. Uh, but no, actually my day is going really well and I'm going really well because I got to talk to Jim Laugren today and he wrote a book called a beer drinkers guide to knowing and enjoying wine. And he also wrote a book called 50 ways to love wine more. I mean, what's not to be excited about these books. And I really, really loved talking to Jim. Uh, because Jim is, uh, I know we live in a culture that, you know, values wine and beer and, and, uh, and it's, uh, we talk about how beer and wine is just all over the world and it's an ancient drink and it's been around forever, but he talks about how to drink wine and not be a snob about it, um, how to jump in, uh, to drinking wine and different beers. And even if you're not a wine drinker or even a beer drinker, or maybe you want to learn how to do, you know, enjoy other kinds of beer or wine, he's going to be your guy. And so he has a lot of experience in this realm, working in the, the beer and wine industry for many years, he wrote a couple books about it, and you're just going to love his perspective um, because he's trying to help us not be snobs about wine because we should because right? wine is an ancient drink that's really just grapes that are smoshed fermented grape juice. Um, it's really not that complicated, but we've made it this kind of weird thing and only certain people can drink it, etc., etc. So, uh, so you're going to love my, my time with, with Jim Laugren and um, there was a little hiccup. We had a little power outage in the middle of this, so hopefully I splice it together and you won't even notice, but I just want to let you know our conversation sounded a little different at one point. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, we made it work, and so I'm really happy that uh, it all worked out. And so before I get to my interview with Jim, uh, just a, a quick reminder, uh, stay connected with the show, stay connected with uh, some of the things I'm doing and creating and making. Uh, RyanJPelton.com. Uh, you can see some free resources on there. You can get signed up for the newsletter. You can see some essays, some other things I've written on there. Uh, check it out. Um, and yeah, stay updated on when the podcast comes out. That's always a great way to do that. Um, stay connect, connected to our, our little creative community that's growing there um, and, and help each other and encourage each other. And uh, so, so check all that out. Hopefully that is a blessing to you and, and helpful to you and uh, serves you in a million ways. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Jim Laugren. Welcome everyone to the Prolific Creator. I'm so thankful today to have Jim Lochran on the show. And Jim is going to talk to us today a little bit about his books, A Beer Drinker's Guide to Knowing and Enjoying Wine and 50 Ways to Love Wine More. And I'm really excited to talk to him because I have many, many questions about drinking beer and wine, two of my favorite things. <laughs> and uh, so Jim, why don't you say hello and tell us uh, maybe one thing that only someone I should say a closest friend or family member would know about you. Uh, well, good afternoon, Ryan. Great to be with you. Uh, one thing that only a friend or family member would know is probably that I have a uh, slight mole behind my left elbow. But uh, other than that, I'm pretty much an open book. So all right, ha happy to be here with you. Happy to share and uh, answer any of your relevant beer and wine questions on top of everything else. Yes. Well, yeah, let, well, let's start with you. So uh, obviously a love for beer, a love for wine. Uh, you've worked in the wine industry. Um, and so I have a lot of obviously thoughts on that, but uh, it sounds like you've written a book that's really about uh, helping those that maybe don't want to be snobby about wine, or uh, you don't have to be an expert to enjoy wine. So you have some unique perspective on that. But let's go kind of way back in the the time machine. And how did you kind of get into this world of of wine and winemaking and tasting and and helping others do the same? I had actually enjoyed wine for a very long time, probably since college. And of course, my friends were all drinking beer and frequently too much of it. Uh, and while I enjoy beer, and I still to this day enjoy beer, uh, there was something about wine that just spoke to me a little bit more. So, you know, even even then I would put together a spaghetti dinner and invite a bunch of friends over and open up a 
jug of something from California, which was probably the worst rot gut uh, available. But again, there was something about it that re just related to my palate or my palate related to it. And so through my life, I uh, always uh, made a, uh, an, an opportunity when I could to enjoy some wine. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, but I did then begin to learn a little bit and uh, at one point started a tiny collection, a collection being, you know, five or six bottles, uh, not drinking everything you had at one night. That was a collection. <laughs> so uh, that, that's kind of how it began. Uh, then I was uh, many years later in a tasting group, actually in Miami. Uh, with a number of people who were pretty much as geeky as I was. And one of the people in the group was a, a doctor who owned a wine distribution company. He was having a lot of trouble with it uh, in terms of business and expanding the market, something I knew pretty well. And so we agreed that I would come in and, and uh, act essentially as president of the company and build it up. So that was the point at which my love of wine switched from an avocation to a vocation. Uh, and and things, things just got uh, more intense from there. I learned a lot more. There's so much to learn. You could, it's one of those topics that you could study for, you know, 12 hours a day for the rest of your life and not know half of it. So that's what keeps it interesting to me too. I, you know, I think, and you probably would attest to this that when you're in a uh, when you're in an endeavor that's easily learned and easily mastered, it also leads to boredom, and uh, it's pretty easy to also lose interest. Mm -hmm. So wine is certainly not something of that nature. Wine always has more to teach you. Uh, it always has a bit of history or a bit of chemistry or a bit of whatever that you didn't know. So uh, I find it to be eternally fascinating. Yeah, I think there's uh, some threads there. Uh, you know, my wife and I years ago went to a wine tasting uh, deal. It was actually on an anniversary. We went up to this to this place in Traverse City, uh, Michigan, and it's a yes. little, wi little winery there. And, um, mm -hmm. and did, you know, they gave us the whole tour and kind of showed us how the wine was made. Um, and then many years after that, we went to a, uh, place that made beer and kind of had the same experience. And we were just amazed, uh, what goes into making wine and mm -hmm. what, what goes into making beer. And there's something from just experiencing that kind of behind the scenes that you had this deeper appreciation for actually the wine that you enjoy or the beer that you enjoy and, sure. and the time it takes, but also how easily it can be, can come out terrible. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and yeah. so much has to do with, you know, the barrels and so much has to do with how long it sits and all those things. Right. And, uh, right. and so, and also how you get the taste and things. So I was, I was just blown away the first time, a little bit of your story. I, I was just blown away the first time I really got kind of behind the scenes and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, was really fascinating to me. So, uh, so, so tell me, uh, one of the, the things I, I was reading about your book and, and just some comments and re reflections on it was, um, you, you really wanted to write a book that was for the, I don't know if you want to call it the everyday person or someone that just isn't snobby about wine, um, isn't, uh, snobby about beer, right, but really the just non expert, wants, right. Yeah. It just wants to learn and, and wants to have a good mm -hmm. time with it and, mm -hmm. and learn some things along the way. And, um, so my question is in the last few years, probably last I'm not that old, but last 15 to 20 years, I feel like there's been kind of this, the snobbiness that snobbiness that's kind of crept in, especially when it comes to like craft beers and things like that, where it's like, we can't just drink a beer. Now we have to know right, all these things right. and, you know, yes. yeah. you know, how dare you drink that, you know, <laughs> and right. that's anath <laughs> anathema, right? Where, yeah. My question is, where do you think that's come from? Just this idea that like, you know, only certain people can drink wine, only certain people can drink I, you these craft I beers. I don't know. That, that's really a terrible aberration. Uh, and it's fairly new. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that you point out specifically craft beer because craft beer geeks have probably superseded wine geeks in terms of their <laughs> snobbiness, which is right. kind of a remarkable achievement, if you will. Uh, it, it it sort of began when we started paying attention to other people's opinion. In other words, when 
people like wine critics and wine reviewers came on the scene, which in essence is in the last 50 or 60 years. And they became the arbiters of taste. Uh, now, they did it because people allowed them to, quite honestly. Uh, but, you know, why you would listen to someone tell you what wine or what beer you should drink and you should enjoy. And my goodness, if you don't enjoy it, then obviously there's a defect somewhere in your DNA. Uh, it, it's crazy. I mean, if you went into a restaurant and you ordered food, and the waiter said, oh, my God, you're going to have the carrots? Oh, geez, you should have the peas with that. What's wrong with you, you know? I mean, the carrots just aren't the right vegetable choice for this. Hmm. You wouldn't even, I mean, you would laugh, you know? You would you would uh, laugh and certainly ignore that particular type of advice. And yet with wine, we seem to take it to heart. Uh, it's become such a socially... Oh, I don't know. Socially uh, entwined in into our activities and into fine dining, the concept of fine dining and so forth. Uh, uh, probably what didn't help is the the advent as well. In addition to the wine writers, were sommeliers who were intended to be helpful initially. You go to a restaurant and they've got a thousand wines in the cellar. Well, you don't know what they are. And uh, so the sommelier was your interface <clears throat> between your glass and the wine collection that this particular restaurant had. Well, the sommeliers really played it up. Of course, they wore the silver test vine, a little cup around their neck on a chain and, they, you know, had to sniff it and, and sip it. And, and you didn't know what they were sniffing or sipping or looking for. And they would pronounce uh, that it was either sound or it wasn't, and so on and so forth. So we just gave away too much power. And it really, in the end, it, these days, it, it comes down to people wanting to think, I don't know, they're a little better than you, they're a little smarter than you, they're a little whatever. <laughs> it's very much of a privilege thing, too, which mm -hmm. is which is uh, quite a lot of BS, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you talk about the... Um, the the beer craft beer people <clears throat> you know the dirty little secret in craft beer is that every wacky crazy craft brewery has the same number one beer and that number one beer is in almost all cases is some kind of light lager some straight ahead simple tasty easy to enjoy uh beer that everyone can get behind. It's not the 8% alcohol, triple IPA, double wooded, chocolate infused, <laughs> you know, a hairy bearded uh, can. That, that really is not a big seller. Now, yes, there are certainly uh, beer geeks who will go after that stuff, but that, that's not where it, it's happening. You know, we have to realize that beer and wine have jointly been part of the human experience for at least 10,000 years. They're intimately involved with uh, every establishment of religion, uh, of worship, of uh, medicine, of art, uh, of ceremony, of government, of economics, uh, the the free free men and they were free men. They were not slaves who built the pyramids, for example, were paid primarily in beer. That was their that was their main wage. Uh, you can go back to Mesopotamia and look at the uh, the inventory list for the royal household, and everyone got a daily allotment of wine. And it was based on how close you were to the king. You know, the king obviously got the most, uh, or probably the queen got the most. The king thought he got the most. And then it went down from there, right down to someone who was a little courier and, and of minor importance might get, you know, a, an equivalent to a quart of wine a day. But that was considered part of life. Uh, realized that prior to the invention of antibiotics, 
wine and honey were the two major drugs in the world. Our entire pharmacopoeia was built around these two items because of their healing properties and their anesthetizing properties. So in the case of wine, sometimes it was just drinking the wine itself. And in other times, wine was used as the medium in which other herbs and spices would be dissolved and blended and so forth. Uh, wounds were bathed in wine. Uh, I mean, Homer will tell you that in reading the Iliad and the Odyssey. So this is something that's been around for a long, long time, and it was never uh, subject to this snobbiness until very, very recent years. So it's something we can do without. My, my writing and my speaking is really all directed at de-snobbifying wine, like you know? That. I mean, the bottom line is it's fermented grape juice. Mm -hmm. Let's not get too excited here, kids, <laughs> you know? Let's not go crazy. Uh, and it takes zero talent to make wine. Mm -hmm. Now, before the winemakers all rise up and start throwing spears in my direction, uh, let me explain a little bit that wine is a self-contained beverage if you will, all it has to happen to make wine is to take a grape and break the skin. That's it. Because the skin is home to yeast. They live on the skin of grapes. When you break the skin, the juice in the grapes is now available to the yeast. And the juice is filled with sugar. Obviously, if the, we're assuming the grape is ripe at this point. And the yeast will get in there and uh, it's their action in actually eating and ingesting the sugar that converts the liquid to wine. You know, so when we talk about how was wine discovered as opposed to invented, because it wasn't really invented, you know, who really knows? I mean, this, as I say, this could easily have been 10,000, 12,000 years ago. We have documented proof that Wine was being drunk and made in large quantities uh, as long ago as 8,000 years in the, in the Republic of Georgia, which is the homeland, the motherland, the fatherland of wine, uh, the holy land for people like me. Uh, but anyway, some group, some clan, some hunter, some tribal uh, uh, gathering of people is is out picking grapes they're hunter gatherers this is what they eat they're out picking grapes and they're throwing them into a probably a skin bag some skin of some animal that they have killed at some point and uh sewn it up and this is their bag and they carry it and someone comes running through camp and says hey there's you know there's a mammoth down the road we gotta we've got there was no road but there's a mammoth over the hill we've got to quickly get down there and everyone packs up and runs for the hunting party. Well, hunting a mammoth is no easy task. So it takes them two or three or four days, five days, whatever. And they come back and when they get back to camp, they've left a lot of things there, including this leather bag filled with grapes that are now broken and crushed. And in that four or five days, all that juice, all that liquid, has been converted to wine just naturally. Someone smells it, tastes it. A brand new experience. I mean, think about that, you know, at a time when life was miserable and cold and difficult and everything was hard. And, and suddenly you can taste this thing that just appeared magically. And it makes you feel good. It warms you up. It, uh, you know, it, it, it was quite a thing. So uh, you know, we've really been enjoying wine as a species for that long. So we should just respect that. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I want people to approach wine as a right. You know, it's not a privilege. It's your right. Have a, you want a glass of wine? Have a glass of wine. You have a right to enjoy whatever you like. If your palate's uh, one that's prone to enjoy red fruit, my palate's one that's prone to enjoy taste of wood, who cares? It doesn't make any difference. It, it, it's just something that uh, 
that we can both enjoy without having value judgments over whose taste is better. Well, I appreciate you giving us that that overview because I, I yeah, have a, I'm sorry, I get carried away. Yeah, so no, it's I'm great. Right. No, because I, I think you're you're demystifying a lot of what winemaking is and and you know we, how we've made it so snobby, be you know for reasons we don't need to. But um, I remember years ago, my parents uh, they're they're a little bit you know, wine connoisseurs and uh, traveled mm-hmm. to Europe. They actually lived in Europe for quite a few years. So they collected some good wines along the way. And I remember they invited me and my wife over and did a, did a tasting for us and kind of laid out all these different wines and see if, you know, maybe like this, maybe like that. And it was just funny because um, going back to your point of, you know, our palates is, you know, this really expensive, you know, hundred dollar bottle that I really didn't enjoy. And then this kind of cheaper, <laughs> mm-hmm. cheaper version that I just really loved. And, you know, I almost felt bad, like what's wrong with me, you know, <laughs> like I should like right, the really right. expensive, you know, aged uh, wine versus the, you know, $10 bottle or whatever. Um, but that was just, you know, personal preference. And, uh, you know, my Absolutely. wife, my wife liked yep. other, other things. <laughs> Well, it, it, that is so true. And uh, when people go out and they, they want to go out for an evening, go to a wine bar, just try new things. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's a wonderful thing to do too. explore what's out there. In a way, we're kind of in the golden age of wine, thanks to the efficiency, not at this very moment, but overall, the efficiency of international trade and of shipping. Uh, there's more wine available, at least in our country. There's more wine available from more places than there ever has been. You know, if you went back 20 years in the United States or 30 or 40 years to the United States, the supply of wine reduces dramatically. And the sources of those wines reduce dramatically as well. You know, I mean, you might have had a Chianti from, you know, Italy, and you might have had, you know, some Bordeaux and Burgundies from France and, uh, some uh, Cabernets from Napa Valley and uh, Chardonnay or two thrown in. And quite frankly, that was it. I mean, that was the wine landscape. But as we have as a people developed more sophisticated, I use that word advisedly, but indulge me, palate on everything. I mean, coffee, bread, cheese, all these things that 50 years ago were, were basically commodities have now become luxury goods because we understand more about how, how they're made, how to make them, how to improve them, uh, how to uh, differentiate them and so forth. And uh, the same thing has happened with wine. But, you know, I can go to a little wine shop and I can find wonderful bottles from Greece and from South America and from New Zealand and, you know, wherever. So. If you're used to drinking wine and it's always a glass of Pinot Noir from California, or it's always a glass of Pinot Grigio from Italy, uh, just try something new next time. You know, just let yourself, let your palate, you know, it's like like going to a candy store and getting the same candy all the time. Don't you want to see what's in those other (laughs) trays and those other bins, you know? Don't you want to get a bag mixed up with everything in there when you're a kid? Well, Jim, we were talking about snobby wine folks, and uh, I happen to live in Missouri, and I know you mentioned, uh, you know, California being one of the you know top wine places. And I'm actually originally from California, so it's kind of funny. I've traded places, uh, but mm-hmm. a few years ago, I, w- I was noticing there's all these wineries in Missouri, and kind of got curious and just started digging in a little bit, and found out that you know early 19th century, um, that Missouri was one of the best wine places in America. Yeah, it certainly was. Actually, what changed the the landscape more than anything was prohibition. Uh, it shut down so many wineries uh, and and hindered and damaged so many wine businesses that many of them just didn't recover. Uh, Missouri had a much longer history, of course, than that, and uh, in in fact is is known even today as the home of the Norton grape. Norton being probably the finest wine grape that's native to North America. And uh, they've done a terrific job with it. The area around St. Charles and so forth is is very strong in terms of uh, their history and their production. Uh, so the, the beauty of wine is that it has become almost ubiquitous. Uh, in fact, there are wineries now in all 50 states. 
Now, they don't grow everything that they bottle where they're located. So you're not going to get a lot of real high quality grapes grown in South Florida. It's just too hot. Uh, it doesn't really work. And you're not going to get a lot of high quality grapes grown in Alaska uh, or Hawaii. But those places import juice, uh, not unusual at all, or import grapes if, uh, if the logistics allow it and make wine. So it's fun. Wherever you are, you can go to a winery that's not too far away. Uh, and that's just a, a, a very enjoyable activity. It's one of the things actually mentioned in 50 Ways to Love Wine More is to, is to visit a winery, is to, you know, walk through the door and smell that, that wonderful aroma of grapes fermenting and wine aging and so forth. Mm -hmm and talk to the winemaker, particularly in these smaller wineries, outside of the big wine regions, you're much more likely to have the winemaker, him or herself, giving you a little tour and explaining how things happen. And, uh, and then you can go to the tasting room and, and try half a dozen wines. So it, it's really a great activity for a weekend or something, you know, a, a different kind of a date, whatever, whatever people are doing these days. Uh, it just can be a good time. Yeah. My, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, my wife and I went on a, a trip to Traverse city, Michigan and yes. uh, went to the small winery there. And it's exactly what happened. We were just hanging out in the tasting room and the, the, the winemaker was like, Hey, I'm going to bed. You guys can taste as many wines as you want. Just lock up when you're done. And, and yeah. the, the next day he gave us a tour and we, with a couple other people and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, um, and going back to your point about just the, where wine can grow, uh, different grapes, different parts of the country, different parts of the world. Uh, I think it's interesting because then each wine has its own unique flavor because of that, that climate and that, uh, area and the way it grows, which I think makes wine so unique when you think of the different drinks that we take in, it, it just, you know, it's kind mm -hmm. of a regional flavor depending on, you know, how it's made and where it's made and what time sure. of year and all those th mm -hmm. things. So, um, and I think that's, uh, you know, going way back to earlier in our conversation, you were saying how, uh, you know, wine is such a, uh, I don't know if you call it multicultural or monocultural, every culture has different, you know, wine's been around for tens of thousands of years sure. um, mm -hmm. because it can grow anywhere. And it's not this, you know, one group of people had it nailed down and figured it out, but it, uh, it, it can go everywhere. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the, the background and the, the backdrop, because I think that gets people excited too. If you're traveling and you're looking for a place to have some fun and learn about different wines and beers, that's a good, good way to do it. Um, now, Jim, uh, you have written a couple books and, uh, one of the things we love to do on this show is to talk about just kind of creative process and how you came up with the ideas of these books. Um, I know we've, we've touched on a little bit, some of the ideas, uh, behind just wanting to kind of, uh, de-snobify, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. you know, wine drinking and beer drinking. Um, but, but tell me a little bit like the, um, you know, had you written anything before these books? Uh, you know, where'd the idea come from to put it in book form? Cause I'm always interested in kind of the origin story of like, you know, how did you think about, you know, which wines and beers to focus on and how would the book be laid sure. out? Like how did all those ideas kind of come to you as you're putting this together? Well, a lot of it was just the result of what I was seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, both as a wine importer uh, and then as a trainer for uh, restaurants, primarily for restaurant staff, uh, teaching people about wine and teaching the wait staff about wine and how to present wine and, and so forth, how to assess wine, whatever the case may be. Uh, and I realized that there were holes in the, in the general knowledge base that were uh, oftentimes driven not by someone's lack of interest, but by, by just the whole system of wine. It, it had become too rarefied. Uh, people began to think that, uh, you know, you couldn't really enjoy wine as much as the smart people did, mm. as much as the experts did, if you didn't know what they knew that there was somehow some kind of secret handshake, you know, and, and once you had the secret handshake, boy, then you could be a connoisseur. But until then, you were just kind of a stumbling oaf. And, and people really apologized for their lack of wine knowledge and so forth. And, and that just kind of bothered me. That's wrong. Everyone should enjoy wine. Uh, as I may have said to you a little earlier, I mean, it is just fermented grape juice here. 
Right. So, you know, we don't want to get uh, crazy about it and pretend that it's it's something else. And this whole snobbery thing is a fairly recent development in the world of wine. So uh, there's no there's no need for it. In fact, I was thinking about this earlier today and doing some other writing. Uh, there is a book out uh, that's called uh, Neuroenology. So it, it's written by a Yale professor of something, I think in the medical school, a biochemist or whatever. Uh, very interesting in that he has tracked exactly where in the brain uh, the experience of wine emanates from and travels to. And what he has found is that the absolute expert, you know, a real wizard, a real wine student, a real wine geek, experiences wine through a slightly different pathway than does the person who knows nothing about wine. However, their level of uh, pleasure is equal. The experience, the pleasurable aspect of the experience is just as intense. The expert may be looking at it slightly differently than the amateur is, but they're both enjoying it to the same degree. And I found that to be fascinating. So it really doesn't matter what you know. I mean, I could study wine and have studied wine for years and years and years, but that doesn't mean that if I sit someone down who has the occasional glass and doesn't really know much about wine at all, they can enjoy a glass of something wonderful just as much as I will. So that really encourages sharing as well. And that was that was kind of underlying much of 50 ways to love wine more. You know, it was, what can we learn? What can we know? Or in this case, I guess, what can the readers learn? What can the readers know that will help them to appreciate wine as a category, as an entity uh, more without having to go to school and without having to read 400 page books and without having to take courses in fermentation science and chemistry and so forth. Uh, so that's really, you know, it's really kind of my approach. Uh, as far as a beer drinker's guide to knowing and enjoying fine wine, what I found in all of the classes that I've taught is that there was frequently someone in the class or two or three people in the class who would come up to me and say, you know, I just love wine, but I can't get my significant other off beer. You know, they just, uh, you know, whatever, my, my, my wife just loves beer or my husband or my boyfriend just loves beer. And I, as much as I try to get them to drink wine, you know, it, they don't they don't really get it. And I remember once I was doing a television interview somewhere. Actually, it was in Ohio, I believe. And this lady was the morning host and we were talking about this very thing. And I said, well, how about you? Does your husband like beer? And she says, oh, my God, like it's his job. I mean, you know, <laughs> so there's a way to introduce people to beer and there's a way to not introduce people to beer. And the mistake that many wine drinkers make is to assume that a beer drinker is going to respond to wine, the same wines that they respond to. You know, we always have to be cognizant of the fact that we all have different palates. And so we have to present information in that way. I mean, that's part of the creative setup of the book, if you will. And uh, for instance, if you are talking to a beer drinker who loves uh, triple IPAs, just a big beer, full mouth of bitterness and and uh, and hoppiness and you know the hop monster kind of craft beer. If that's what someone drinks every day, and then you say, "Oh, come on, you've got to try some wine." You know, I want you to drink wine with me, and you give them a glass of Pinot Grigio, which is an, a very light wine. You know, a couple steps up from water, quite frankly. They're not going to enjoy it. I mean, the experience is just too different. So you really want to kind of match the intensity of the experience. 
You know, on the other hand, if someone likes, you know, Miller Lite or Coors Light or some very light beer, and that's what they drink all the time, then maybe starting out with a Pinot Grigio or some, uh, you know, unaged Chardonnay is the way to go. But you kind of have to match uh, the, as I say, the the fullness, the richness, the mouth feel, the mouth experience, uh, because it's a very different experience to take a mouthful of, of a very light bodied white wine versus taking a mouthful of a very big, brawny, high alcohol red wine. And uh, you just need to be aware of that. That's really helpful. Um, So as you're, you know, kind of going, you're thinking about all these things, like who's the audience and, you know, is it someone who's scared of, you know, beer or scared of wine or had a bad experience or not sure where to start? How did you kind of narrow down, you know, 50, one, you know, one of your books, 50 ways to love wine more. Did you have, you know, a hundred things and just kind of narrow it down there? How, how did you, you know, settle on, on 50? Um, you know, cause I'm always curious of, you know, you obviously you got to only keep it into a certain amount of pages and not have it be a right, 800, 800 right. page tome, unless that's what you want. But, um, but yeah, what was kind of your process of just narrowing down? What information do I want to share? What do I want to leave out? Uh, what did that look like? Well, I sat down and over a course of a couple of days, I just quickly scribbled out the topics that I thought should be touched on. Uh, just what came to my mind and then set it aside, reflected on it, you know, let the process churn in my head through a couple of nights and so forth. And then came up with, with a list that was, I don't recall what it was. Maybe it was, uh, 60, something like that. Uh, and then it was, it was really a matter of just saying, okay, well, how long do you want these chapters to be? And 50 seemed like a much smoother number to go with than 60. It's just a round, simple number. Uh, I knew that I wanted the chapters to be at least, you know, five or six pages a piece because uh, I wanted to provide some substance. Uh, and so that, you know, as you say, then you look at how long a book do you want to have? And I wasn't looking for a 400 page book or a 300 page book uh, because that's one of the things that puts people off who are trying to learn about wine or just get more exposed to wine. You know, the the casual wine drinker who says, oh, this looks like an interesting book. Well, if the book is, you know, the thickness of a dictionary, it's not going to look like such an interesting book anymore to someone. That in and of itself is intimidating. And the whole point here is to get rid of the intimidation factor. So the book is, is certainly large enough uh, and thick enough that you see that there's real substance in it, but you don't think you're going to have to send, spend the next six months reading it. So it, it's kind of a it, it's kind of an interesting thing. The audience has changed in a lot of things. Um, I'm I've just finished writing another book, and this one, Ryan, is actually uh, a wine focused crime novel. I like it. So I'm going the fiction route here. Uh, But I looked very closely at contemporary literature, what the trends are and what they aren't and so forth, uh, because there's no point in spending a chunk of your life, three years or so, writing a book and then getting no market for it because you're talking about a subject no one cares about or you've done something that violates the precepts of the genre or whatever the case may be. Uh, And I realized that the younger audience, which is most everyone compared to me, (laughs) uh, doesn't have an interest in reading 20 and 30 page chapters anymore. People like to be able to pick up their phone or their iPad or whatever device they're using and quickly, maybe while they're waiting for an appointment somewhere, they're at the doctor's office or they're, uh, if they were commuting, they're on the train waiting for their stop or the subway or the bus or whatever the case may be. And they want to flip through and they'd like to be able to read a discrete piece of whatever they're reading in a shorter period of time. So the overall trend in the book world generally has, 
with the exception of very geeky nonfiction books that may be uh, specific to a scientific community or something of this nature. Uh, but the trend is to have shorter and shorter chapters. You know, and I'm sure you've recognized that in whatever reading you do, that, gee, think about it, 20 years ago, you know, it would have taken me three days to get through this chapter. And now, now in three days, I'm going through 15 chapters. Well, why is that? It's because they're all shorter. You know, you don't have to bookmark everything, you know, read a, a page, a dense page and a half, and that's it, you know. Yep. Uh, it, it, it's just a different approach to, I guess, relating to your audience, mm -hmm. you know, giving people something the way they like to have it. So if someone wants to read a book of mine on their phone and they want to read it in short little chunks, then that's how I should present it to them. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, because if I write a, a more... Oh, I don't know, classical style book with 20, 30 page chapters, people are going to lose interest. They're just not going to get to the end of things. Yep. So, and I think there's a, yeah, there's, there's some wisdom in that, uh, those listening, I know we have a lot of creative people and writers and, um, writing books is, is yeah. Knowing your audience, knowing who it's for, knowing the day in which we live in, um, you know, even knowing the, the history of publishing, I mean, the, you know, publishing in the old days, I mean, not even the old days, last 30 years. I mean, they, they packed in books, you know, pretty long just so they looked better on the shelf. I mean, some of it wasn't just, you know, they needed to write a thousand page book, but it was just because they had to justify the printing costs and it had to look like it was a beefy, but sure. you know, you've read, you've read novels where, you know, 200 pages could be cut out and it would still be fine. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, was reading, I was reading a book recently. I won't say the name, but I mean, there was a hundred pages that had no point in the story. I mean, it just kind of took the character off you yeah. know, out of the story for a hundred pages, then brought them back. And it was like, why was that even in there? It didn't really help yeah. the story yeah. at all. Um, so yeah, no, I think that's really smart. And, uh, and the devices we read on, you know, people can, you know, read Kindle or read, uh, you know, iPad swipe mm -hmm. you know, on vacation and just swipe through on the train in the car, audiobooks, right. all those things. Um, no, that's really smart. And I think like you were saying about your wine book is, yeah, you could have written, you know, the all inclusive, you know, history of wine and, you know, get super geeky and say, that's what it needs to be. Or you could say, I really just want to expose people. So I want to give them, you know, tongue in cheek, a taste of wine, you know, not, not a whole bottle and just get them interested. Right, right. And, and, um, you know, rather than writing this long thing that nobody's going to write. Um, and I'd also add too, like for most of us, we're not household names. And so they're giving you a chance. They're giving you a shot mm -hmm. to read your book it can't be a thousand pages with, you know, like you said, 30 page chapters, or they're just going to put it down unless you're uh, right. No one's going to, well, no one's going to pick it up in the first place. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's good. Um, so, so Jim, tell me like after you kind of, you know, you got your 50 things, you wrote the book, you know, you're mm -hmm. thinking about editing, you're thinking about covers, you're thinking about publishing. What did you kind of do once you had this manuscript and you're like, okay, I have this thing now. What, do, you know, what did I let someone look at it? Like what, what was kind of your next uh, steps for that? Right. Well, the process of producing the book, once you have a manuscript, is, is kind of a whole different job, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a firm believer in editing, and I'm also smart enough to know I'm not smart enough. <laughs> right. And so with both these books, uh, I have hired a professional editor and had them go through and, and uh you know, do their thing, red pencil me to death. And some of the suggestions maybe I didn't agree with because it was a voice thing or I wanted to maintain a certain attitude, but many of the changes were invaluable. And of course, I always find the, you know, just the typos. And if you live with a manuscript for two or three years and you've read it 50 times, you don't see those typos anymore. No. You just don't see them. Your eye, your brain has become so, uh, so accustomed to reading a sentence a certain way that if you've got the word is twice in there back to back and you've read it that way 50 times, you're not going to catch it the 51st time no. or chances are slim anyway that you will. So professional editing is very important. And I think that's one of the, the weakest aspects uh, of the product 
that many self-published authors put out mm -hmm. uh, because editing can be expensive, but you know what? Spend that seven or 800 bucks or thousand bucks or whatever it is, because it will come back to you in spades. If you have a poorly edited book, it will never be great. It'll never break through anything. So at least give you your, give yourself the chance. So to answer your question, so I send the manuscript off to the editor. Uh, I contact uh, a uh, cover designer. Uh, we start talking about cover concepts and uh, working that. I begin to assemble uh, a, a marketing team, if you will. Uh, in the case of the first book, I hired a publicity firm that specializes in books. Uh, and they were very helpful. I had a terrific lady working with me, but it's also pretty pricey stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had a number of months of working with them, but as I say, it, it, uh, it puts a dent in the piggy bank. So you've got to, you've got to use their advice and their contacts wisely. Uh, and then, uh, before the second book came out, the 50 ways book, I hired a publicist who is still with me and she's been terrific. Uh, she uh, books a lot of things for me, uh, you know, TV, radio, podcasts, uh, library talks, all kinds of things. Okay. And uh, so she's good, she's good. So that's very helpful. And then you've, you've, you've kind of got to, if you want to do it right, once you get the material back from the editor, then you have to go through the final edit yourself and accept or reject their suggestions. Uh, then you've got to line up the printing for it, uh, which of course can be difficult as well. Um, it, it's kind of the, the curse, the catch 22 of a small business is buying printing in quantity uh, because the per unit cost goes down so much if you buy a lot of units. So the difference between having, you know, 500 books printed and 3000 books printed is ter tremendous, huge difference. So you get seduced by that per unit cost and then you end up with, you know, thousands of books. Uh, so you better know how you're gonna sell them. Uh, otherwise uh, the savings weren't so great after all. So you've got all those things to consider. Uh, and reviews are very important, uh, getting reviews from readers. But even before that, getting reviews from uh, respected services like Kirkus or, or whatnot, uh, very important as well. And then, of course, you can quote uh, those reviews or lines from the reviews on the cover art. Sure. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a whole nother thing. It's, it's a, it's a production business mm -hmm. once you've finished writing. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think it's good for people to hear all this because, you know, when people talk about, you know, self-publishing or indie publishing or small publishing houses, it's really not, it's never really self because it's a team. It's a team effort. It's editors, Absolutely. it's cover yeah. designers, it's, you know, pr people who promote the work it's, you know, social media, it's, you know, printers, you name it. Right. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it takes a community of people to, uh, you know, get books out into the world. And, and I've really, um, I've enjoyed just over the years being part of kind of the writing publishing indie community, just cause they're very helpful. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we have questions or, I mean, it's partly why I do this podcast. Um, uh, you know, there's people you can go to, they'll, you can email them and they'll respond. And, and it's, it's pretty neat just to be able to say, Hey, what about, have you, who have you used for this or who's publicizing sure, your great. books or, yeah. Where'd you get those reviews from or who's your designer? I really like your cover design, you yeah. know, those kinds of things. And, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. How I think that generous the, people are. the indie book community is very open and giving. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard of someone refusing to give someone else a piece of information. Right. Yeah. So yeah, as you say, whatever you need, where'd you, you know, yeah. who, who can you suggest as an editor or, you know, how much should it be costing or, or uh, you know, are you happy with your printer, yada, yada, whatever it is, people are pretty open and pretty free about uh, trading inside information, if you will. Yeah. 
That's good. Well, Jim, this has been a uh, great conversation about a lot of things, uh, even digging deep into the world of wine and wine snobbery <laughs> and uh, the origins of that. Uh, thank you for sharing your creative process as well. And, uh, and I'd love to, I got two kind of last questions. One would just be what's, you know, one big learning that you had, or one takeaway that you've had through kind of this process of writing and sharing your work. Um, what, what's kind of one thing that stuck with you. And then lastly, kind of what, what are you working on now and where can people find you? I think the one big takeaway is that if you present something that is of value, people will appreciate it and buy it. But they're interested in what it will do for them, not what it will do for you. Hmm. Will this make me a more confident buyer of wine when I go in the store? You know, I've always felt silly talking to a wine salesperson because I don't know anything. Well, yes, this will make you more confident. This will make you more confident and more comfortable, and it will make you appreciate your good choices better. And to understand your bad choices are ones that every wine geek goes through. Everyone gets a battle, a bottle of bad wine that they wish they hadn't bought at some point. Uh, so that's just part of the game, you know? So th that's, that's the thing. It's not so much what I want to do, but it's how can I help my reader? You know, what information do I have and how can I package it so that they find it appealing to a lot of people have, have had nice things to say about my writing style. And that's been kind of a conscious effort on my part, because when you're reading it, I want you to feel good. I want you to enjoy yourself. And if you do, then I can slip some things in and teach you a few things. and You don't even realize what happened mm -hmm. as opposed to being, you know, an old, uh, you know, whatever, an old head of the classroom beat it into you uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess that's it. Just how are you going to help your reader? What's this going to do? And it may be something as simple as provide entertainment. Mm -hmm. It may be provide valuable information, but whatever it is, oh. know uh, what value your book is going to bring to the world. And, you know, is it going to make the world a little bit better place? Uh, if not, then why bother? That's good. You call it infotainment. How about that? There you go. Sure. <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, you mentioned working on a novel, got some other things going, but yeah, tell people what you're working on now and where they can find you. Uh, I am currently finishing and uh, getting ready. Hope we'll, hopefully we'll publish it this year, a novel called Somoye. Uh, and it is uh, a novel that's going to resonate, I hope, with wine lovers and people who like action and adventure. And also people who like a human story of overcoming the odds. The, uh, the protagonist in this book is someone who's challenged uh, uh, in his own life, in fact, challenged with cancer and is undergoing chemo during the course of the book, but doesn't quit. Uh, even being on hands and knees and at the porcelain throne, uh, gets back up and does what needs to be done because there's a, there's a matter of integrity involved. And I, I think it's just a, you know, let's overcome. We we all face challenges in our lives or family members ch face challenges in their lives. So it's wonderful to be able to overcome those and uh, move ahead and and uh, achieve our goals. And I like that. That sounds great. Well, hey, keep us uh, updated on that and we'll uh, have you back on when it when it goes live so people can. So, um, sounds wonderful. It. Um, All right. And then uh, people can find you on your, uh, is your website the best place or? Well, for right now, Amazon is probably the best okay. place. Uh, go to Amazon. I also have two eBooks that are only on Amazon, one of which I think is free. So okay. uh, they're 15 minute guides. They're short eBooks, uh, one on red wine, one on white wine. Perfect. Uh, so they're kind of fun reads and they really teach you a lot. Uh, these two books are available. I'm, we're about to have the website redone. So okay. knock on wood in a, you know, in a month or so, we'll have a great uh, website where it'll be easy to 
to do this kind of thing as well uh, through Crosstown Publishing. Uh, so until then, uh, if you would prefer to support your local bookseller, which I am a big fan of doing, then you can go to your uh, to that store and ask them to order it. Uh, the books are available through all of the major distribution systems that bookstores use, so they can easily enough put it on their next door to put a copy or two uh, and bring it in for you. So Perfect. if you want it right now, tomorrow, the next day, then go to Amazon. Mm -hmm. If you've got a day or two <laughs> longer to wait, then go to your local bookstore and ask them to order it for you. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Jim, so much. And uh, yeah, thanks for, I love uh, these kind of interviews where we learn some things, especially about wine and beer and, and other fun mm -hmm. things, uh, but also loved hearing about your creative process and how you came up with this book and the work you're doing. And so keep on doing it and uh, look forward to talking to you again sometime. Great. Thanks very much, Ryan. Well, there you have it, my friends. I don't know about you, but I think I want to go have a glass of wine or perhaps a nice craft beer. I don't know. Uh, whatever suits your fancy or nothing if you're not into that that's fine too but uh, i loved uh, talking to jim uh, i loved his perspective i love just him trying to defend and beat away the wine snobbery uh, that is our, our culture because i think wine's something to be enjoyed and then you know relegated to a certain group of people and uh, so go check out his books a beer drinker's guide to knowing and enjoying wine i put them in the show notes you can enjoy those um yeah what a great way to uh kind of get into the forays of good wine and, and beer and uh, enjoying the flavors that it is and, and uh, the way it even gives us glad hearts and so uh, so thanks jim for coming on the show uh, go check out his work the things he's working on i know he's even working on a novel um, as well and so thanks jim for coming on the show before you go i'd really appreciate it if you would leave a rating or review on itunes or wherever you listen to this podcast it really helps us get get this podcast out in the world and get more ears on it um, and uh, really appreciate the, the kind feedback that you constantly give us uh, to help creative people in the world uh, do the work that they're doing and, uh, and share it with the world and so thank you in, ahead of time it only take a minute um, and uh, really appreciate if you would uh, do that so uh, without further ado, before I sign off today, as I like to say, go make some great art with your life. And I'll talk to you real, real soon.